The Paranormal Network invites you to accompany us on a new journey where we'll take you inside some of the most compelling and mysterious close encounters ever recorded. We'll examine the evidence, we'll listen to the witnesses, we'll consider every possibility. Join us as we investigate history's most infamous UFO incidents. It was a routine patrol, at least. That's how it began. How many police stories start that way? There are likely thousands of officers who will tell you whether in the big city or behind the trees of suburbia, some of their most memorable cases happened soon after they were comfortably in the midst of a routine patrol, just cruising around and waiting for something to happen. Of course, something always happens, and that run-of-the-mill evening becomes something else entirely. Such was the case with California Highway Patrol officers Charles Carson and Stanley Scott, who were in the middle of a fairly mundane task of tracking down a speeding motorcycle near the agricultural city of Corning. Nothing so special about this night, not yet, as the clock ticked towards midnight, but as one might expect, we wouldn't be telling you about officers Carson and Scott if their night's most interesting element was an irresponsible biker. Officers Carson and Scott were about to earn their spot in the archives of startling, unexplainable UFO sightings. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you all for watching UFO Incidents and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. Now, back to the show. It was August 13th, 1960, soon to be the 14th. It was approximately 11.50 at night. Officers Carson and Scott were driving the Hogue Road, a roughly one and a half mile stretch of concrete just east of Corning. They were looking for a speeding motorcycle, but were not in direct pursuit of him. Suddenly, the entire trajectory of their night, maybe their lives, was altered when they caught a glimpse of a remarkable and terrifying sight in the sky. An airliner, well, at least what Carson thought was an airliner, was dropping right out of the sky, as if the power had failed it. The belief that this craft had lost power was aided by the fact that there was an eerie silence to the shocking vision. No sound accompanied the craft's perilous dive to the ground. The car was stopped. Carson and Scott exited and prepared themselves for the worst, naturally believing that they were suddenly going to be thrown into a hectic rescue situation, if indeed anyone could survive such a tremendous fall. The craft was approximately 100 to 200 feet from the ground, from certain fire and agony and mayhem, when it suddenly stopped. Reverse course, going upward again, about 500 feet in the air. Here is Carson describing what he saw next from an official report he gave later that day. And I quote, at this time, it was clearly visible to both of us and obviously not an aircraft of any design familiar to us. It was surrounded by a glow making the round or oblong object visible. At each end or each side of the object, there were definite red lights. At times, about five white lights were visible between the red lights. As we watched, the object moved again and performed aerial feats that were actually unbelievable. The shocked officers radioed the Tehima County Sheriff's Office in nearby Red Bluff and spoke to a deputy named Clarence Fry. They asked Fry to make contact with the local radar base to confirm the unbelievable thing they were seeing. Fry responded with an affirmative. They had the object, allegedly 100 feet long, on radar. Officers Carson and Scott had pulled their guns, unsure of what to do. They watched this bizarre, glowing craft hover above the ground, almost as if curious about its surroundings. Carson could later describe it thusly, and I quote, It was not a conventional aircraft. It was surrounded by a bright white glow, a glow of light. It was shaped similar to a football. A row of white lights ran horizontal to the object across the center of it, and on each end there was a red light which would sweep the countryside as the object turned. The flying object would approach the officer's car more than once, which prompted Scott to turn on their own light and point it at the craft. The craft didn't appear to appreciate that since it would immediately begin to float away from them, all the while using its red light to check out its immediate surroundings. 
Carson told a local radio station some days later, and I quote, I firmly believe it was aware of the presence of the light because the object moved away immediately. As Officer Scott brought the red light on, it moved directly away from us, end quote. The object began to move east, and the two officers pursued it. Presumably, all thoughts of a speeding motorcycle very far from their minds, and their night was far from over. The officers followed the craft as it proceeded east. Carson would later recall that it was capable of moving in any direction. Up and down, back and forth, it moved at high speeds, and several times it would change directions or reverse itself while moving. As was crystal clear to the two officers then and there, this was not an ordinary airliner. The officers had tried in vain several times to radio back to Red Bluff, but the static would interfere with their transmission any time they got close to the object or vice versa. However, they were eventually able to ask for backup as they understandably felt the more eyes on the aircraft, the better. Aside from the static from the radio, there wasn't a peep to be heard in that still night. The object continued to emit zero noise. Carson and Scott's fascination with the flying object was about to double in size. As it turned out, it was not flying solo. According to the officers, a second craft soon joined it in its ballet in the sky. Here are Carson's exact words describing what he saw. As we watched, it was approached by a similar object from the south. It moved near the first object and both stopped, remaining in that position for some time, occasionally emitting a red beam. Finally, both objects disappeared below the eastern horizon. Carson and Scott would observe the crafts for a period of about two hours that night, pursuing gently as it roved about the countryside. Unbeknownst to them, their radio call right after they first saw the object had spurred two deputies to take an interest in the matter and try to lay eyes on it for themselves. One was Clarence Fry, who had taken the call from Carson and subsequently notified the radar base. The other was a deputy named Montgomery. They left their station in Red Bluff and drove a few miles south to the town of Los Molinos, positioning themselves on a hilltop to get a look at whatever it was the officers were talking about. At around 12.30 a.m., less than an hour after first contact, Fry and Montgomery saw something. And it wasn't just one craft, nor merely two. Fry reported that they saw, quote, four objects in the western sky traveling from south to the north in a straight line. At times, they would go straight up or down. One of the objects seemed to hover over the Red Bluff area. After a short time, there was an object seen going from north to the south. Now here's where things start to get curious. Deputy Fry asserts that the four objects they were seeing were in the western sky, while Carson and Scott's pursuit of their objects took them east. It's possible Fry made a mistake, and some of these details are hazy, but his story, or stories, would get more intriguing still. Apparently, sometime after their sighting in Los Molinos, Fry and Montgomery separated, with Fry going back to the Tehima County Sheriff's Office and Montgomery staying behind in Los Molinos. Montgomery radios Fry and says he's now spotted an object landing twice nearby. Fry goes outside the jail to check in the sky and reportedly sees an object coming towards him from the west, an object that stops and hovers above him. Fry calls into the jail and four trustees come out all looking upward and what they see is a large pale yellow object that looks like a railroad car with two red lights on each end with white lights emanating from what he presumes to be windows. Then the object takes off soundlessly, gone in a blink. Moments later, they get a call from a Corning police officer that an object has been seen heading west, moving at great speed. And the sightings weren't relegated to authority figures. It was later reported that four Corning residents who were skywatching that same night saw two objects in the eastern sky that were cigar-shaped, had red and white lights shining from them, and moved about completely soundlessly. The quartet watched as the two objects flew erratically around each other for about 10 minutes before disappearing. Four other Corning residents, a family of four, saw a boomerang-shaped craft approach from the southwest at unbelievable speed, a craft that emitted bursts of white light. This craft was also soundless, and the family assured reporters that what they saw was not an airliner. 
As should be obvious, several people in the Corning Red Bluff area saw something or several somethings in the sky that night. Highway patrolmen, deputies, civilians, none of them had ever seen the likes of it before. And yet the Red Bluff UFO sighting, as it's come to be known, isn't a very famous case in the paranormal world. And that's not because a rational explanation was ever arrived at. It might be because no one ever wanted to explain it at all. The day after the incident, officers Carson and Scott went to the radar base in Red Bluff, the same radar base Deputy Fry had allegedly called the night before to get confirmation that the flying object had been detected. At the time, the base had responded to Fry that yes, indeed they had it, but Carson and Scott were rebuffed when they asked about the eerie phenomenon. The request to speak with the man attending the radar earlier that morning was not granted. Carson would go on to describe their hosts as giving them the ice water approach. The Air Force eventually performed an investigation into the sightings under their Project Blue Book operation, which investigated reports of UFOs from 1947 to 69. Said investigation would not get to the bottom of what happened that night near Red Bluff. Ultimately, the sightings were blamed on atmospheric refraction, with the planet Mars and the stars Aldebaran and Betelgeuse among the suspects. Mars, the Air Force said, was just below the horizon and probably hovered into view due to the refraction of its light by the atmosphere. Of course, that wasn't being bought by many of the participants in the actual event. Carson would remain outspoken about what he and Scott had seen, though they never sought to capitalize on their small place in UFO lore. Some days after their encounter, Carson and Scott appeared on a local radio program to discuss the events. Naturally, they stuck to their story and told their tale without histrionics or excitement. All indications point toward the men being quite pragmatic in nature. When asked if he'd like to offer a guess as to what he saw, Carson offered this intriguingly vague response, and I quote, not in the slightest. I wouldn't even care to form an opinion. I would like to know what it is. When asked what he would say to someone who thought he saw a balloon or optical illusion, Carson retorted, I would say that I wish that person had been sitting where I was and that I had been sitting home. Scott would concur, saying, that's right. It was definitely not a balloon or an optical illusion. We saw something out there. Some years later, Carson would send a letter to the NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. He was steadfast in his refusal to buy into the Air Force's explanation. As to the official explanation, I have been told we saw the Northern Lights, a weather balloon, and now refractions, he explained. I served four years with the Air Force. I believe I am familiar with the Northern Lights, also weather balloons. Officer Scott served as a paratrooper during the Korean conflict. Both of us are aware of the tricks light can play on the eyes during darkness. We were aware of this at the time. Our observations and estimations of speed, size, etc. came from aligning the object with fixed objects on the horizon. I agree, we find it difficult to believe what we were watching, but no one will ever convince us that we were witnessing a refraction of light. And there it stands for the Red Bluff incident has never been given a rational explanation. All we have now are the accounts of people who seem to have witnessed the unbelievable occurring right before their eyes. We may never know what those things were, but refractions of light don't carry much weight literally or figuratively. As with so many other UFO incidents, we'll have to be content with not knowing unless some extraordinary evidence reveals itself sometime soon. Until that happens, we'll hang on to Patrolman Carson's words years after that extraordinary handful of hours. I quote, I know what I saw. It was not a star. I saw what I saw, and I've never seen anything like it before or since. Officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Russia has 